Podcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good morning, everybody. My name is Eric Johnson, and uh, I'm the technical facilitator from Aurora Worldwide Development Corporation hosting the webinar today. You may have noticed that we're having some technical difficulties. Uh, I believe those are attributable to the entire GoToWebinar system at current, uh, at the current time. Uh, we will be trying to resolve these technical difficulties in the background uh, as we're able, but unfortunately, that will not allow us to have webcams today. Uh, we probably will not have the traditional web browser based experience, but if you go out to your mobile app store of choice and type in the word go to webinar and download the mobile app, I'm pretty sure you'll be able to see these slides on the mobile app. So with that, uh, apologies in advance for uh, the technical problems today. The recording, I am fairly sure, <laughs> will be uh, a pretty accurate reflection of the presentations that will be given here today, again, minus the webcams. And I apologize again for that problem. Uh, and I'll turn it over to your host, Missy Hughes, uh, the secretary from the Wisconsin Economic Development Corporation. Hi, good morning, everybody. Thank you. And again, apologize for the uh, technological challenges. But as we all know, uh, you know, being flexible and dynamic in the current atmosphere is um, always a good muscle to be flexing. And so we're, we're working on that this morning and we'll make sure that you're able to access the information um, that is presented today. So we are, I think, in our third of our series of CEO uh, leadership webinars, and we've had a really um, dynamic group so far, and today will be no different. Um, this is a series that, uh, you know, continues to evolve, and really what we're seeing right now is this moment of balancing lives and livelihoods, and, you know, the, the balance of the public health challenge that we're facing along with the economic challenge and the need to um, get rolling on opening the economy. And, you know, certainly in my role at WEDC, we are very, very focused on that. We are working with businesses all of the time to understand how they might innovate and operate in the current atmosphere, what strategies they're taking, and, you know, getting out that information to other businesses because the, the collective mindset on this will really help us all move forward and, and the collective learning. So this series is part of the Regional Leadership Council and WEDC partnership. Uh, the Re Regional Leadership Council is made up of nine regional economic development organizations that are all around the state and they are key strategic partners of WEDC. Um, they are on the ground uh, providing information and helping to implement state strategies on a regional level. So those strategic partners are um, located around the state and uh, if you're able to view the slides you can see um, a list of where they're located. We have Visions Northwest, Momentum West, Seven Rivers Alliance, Prosperity Southwest, Grow North, Synergy, Madison Region, the New North, and Milwaukee Seven. And you know, with having this regional um, approach to economic development coming from uh, a, a um, coordinated state strategy, we can really make sure that we're applying the needs of the whole to all the different parts. And so it's great to have partners like the RLC and to be working with them. Um, there are uh, a couple more slides uh, that you'll see, um, which is really a centerpiece to the work that's happening from the administration and WEDC right now. The first one is the Badger bounce back slide. Um, this is a, a visual depiction of the Badger bounce back plan that was announced by Governor Evers on um, Monday, I believe, which is really um, the effort now to enter into what we need to be reopening the economy, these phases that we need to go through. And part of that also is the Wisconsin Ready Plan. And that's where I come in. That's the part of work we're doing to help businesses get ready. So there's going to be a moment when, you know, these, these gating criteria and such are met that we start to move into more and more opening and, you know, emphasizing that we've already got a lot of the economy open, you know, your, your grocery stores and your gas stations are open, um, manufacturing is happening. Obviously, you know, we have work to do, um, but we are on a, on a path together that balances public health and thinks about public health. It approaches this in a phased manner. And it really is focused on, on data and science and using metrics to understand where we're going to go. And Dr. Raymond today will, will talk more about that. But what I'm going to really ask you to do um, after this 
uh, webinar is over, we're going to have a survey that goes out to ask for your thoughts on the Badger Bounce Back Plan. And I'm asking you to, to go and dig into the Badger Bounce Back Plan. We tend to look at these things from a mindset of what's missing. Um, we need folks to be looking at what's there and think about what's there and how you can find yourself in that plan, how we might support it. Um, if there's you know, pieces that need to be fleshed out, we can work on that and it's helpful to hear that. But really, like, you know, we need to all be rolling up our sleeves and kind of understanding what path we're on together. Um, and then we'll have a survey and we'll ask, you know, for your thoughts on that uh, coming out of this webinar. So I really invite you to do that as we head forward into this um, ongoing challenge that we're all facing together. So today, um, I'm excited to have, a, we have a busy panel, so I want to dive into it. We're going to hear how government and the medical world and business are all working together. We have a great group of panelists. Um, to share their insights. Dr. John Raymond, the president and CEO of the Medical College of Wisconsin is back with us um, to continue to provide us insight into what is happening on the public health side of this. Um, Dr. Dr. Jeff Podhoff is here. He is the chief quality officer of UW Health and, health and is gonna give us a perspective of what's happening with the healthcare system and the healthcare business in this. Brian Hollenbach, is here. He is the Executive Vice President of Green Bay Packaging. And then Jan Allman, the CEO of Fincantieri Marinette Marine is here um, to talk with us about the strategies that they are deploying um, in their businesses and, and the challenges that they're facing. So let me introduce Dr. Raymond, the President and CEO of the Medical College of Wisconsin. Uh, Dr. Raymond, I turn it to you. Thanks, Missy, and good day, everybody. I'm gonna start with some indicators of our progress in flattening the COVID-19 curve throughout Wisconsin. You know, yesterday there were 207 new cases in Wisconsin and on Wednesday we had 225 new cases. I think most of us are concerned by those numbers which are among the highest that we've had since the pandemic began. But it's also possible that an increase in testing led to some, some of that increase. Our average daily growth rate which is calculated using all of the data since March 12th, was 6.1% in Wisconsin. The average growth rate was 3.9% in Wisconsin. And that 3.9% rate reflects what's happened over the last week rather than the last month. And it was slightly worse than Wednesday, so that's something that we need to, to pay attention to. Whoa, the doubling whoa. times using every data point since March 12th continued to improve for about 11.4 days in Wisconsin. Now that doubling time is shorter than the one reported by DHS because we use every data point since the beginning of the pandemic. I think the important takeaway though is that the doubling time continues to improve. If we could go to the next slide, please. This slide shows the daily new COVID-19 cases in Wisconsin since March 12th. And as you can see, although there's some variability, there appeal, appeared to be some leveling off with even the possible beginnings of a decline until this Wednesday when new cases rose for two consecutive days. Again, this increase might be due in part to enhanced testing. Next slide, please. This next slide shows the statewide prevalence of COVID-19. Now, what I wanna point out is um, rural areas have had fewer cases uh, than in urban areas thus far, but the initial mortality rates seem to be higher in these rural areas. Again, though, the numbers are small, so we shouldn't draw too many conclusions from that. But the recent jump in positive cases also, I think, or believe is linked in part to outbreaks in food processing facilities, the most noteworthy of which happened in Brown County. If we can go to the next slide, please. Now, as we begin to coalesce our future planning in the context of the Badger Bounce Back Plan and President Trump's guidelines for opening up America Again plan, I thought it would be helpful to conceptualize the work that needs to be done in three areas of common purpose, dealing with the twin threats of the pandemic and our economy. And collaboration is going to be essential. The first area includes developing health and safety indicators to signal when we can begin to move ahead. And it's important that these indicators are easy to understand, publicly available, and curated by a trusted source. The second part involves safely revitalizing our livelihood, the economy, and the communities in which we live and work. 
And the third involves containment and mitigation approaches, primarily those deployed by our public health leaders. So please take a moment to consider the life, economy, and community priorities for which one key focus must be the development of workplace health and safety practices. Now, a lot has happened in our state over the past week, and we're all looking for a solution set to safely dial up the economy. And I've personally seen several plans, and they all play a role in this broad and comprehensive strategy uh, needed to safely address reopening our economy in a smart fashion. Now, on the next slide, the area that I'd like to shine just a little bit of light on is workplace health and safety principles. This final slide addresses workplace health and safety. And the content on this slide was prepared by Dr. Laura Cassidy at the Medical College of Wisconsin. And it was based on extensive review of the literature and best practices to prepare and protect our workforce, our customers, and our facilities. And the principles for each of these areas were informed by the CDC, the World Health Organization, and OSHA. And I believe these principles are comprehensive and that they can be adapted to and adopted by many different types of businesses, regardless of their size. They also can integrate with the many great ideas and models that other organizations have been putting forward and with the Badger bounce back concept. Now, I do want to emphasize that this framework is only offered in a collaborative spirit and to facilitate further deeper conversations as we move forward. And I believe that a partnership between the health and science experts our government leaders and the business community is essential to get this right. So again, I thank you for the opportunity to continue these important discussions and I'll turn it back over to Missy. And again, Missy, I wanna thank you for your thoughtful and engaged leadership. Thank you, Dr. Raymond, I really appreciate it. Um, Dr. Raymond, uh, are you able to stick with us for the uh, hour today? I'll be here till 11.55, thanks. Okay, great. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and turn it to uh, Dr. Jeff Podhoff and, and Dr. Raymond will come back with a, a panel discussion and, and tie you back in at that time. Um, Dr. Podhoff, thank you. You are the Chief Quality Officer for UW Health. Welcome. Yeah, well, th thanks for having me, Missy. Uh, this is a great opportunity. Uh, I think, you know, before getting into my slides, uh, the, the thing that I, I really kind of want to reflect on from Dr. Raymond's uh, summary is that um, in order to do this smartly, uh, i.e. balance the public health interests with um, the, the clear interest to uh, get going on the economy, uh, it's going to take collaboration. Uh, I think we are all interested in the same thing, which is a good place to start from, but um, this will be a process. Uh, and I think the overarching thing, and I'll mention this in my talk, is uh, you know this won't be a light switch, this will be a, a dimmer. Uh, and we'll have opportunities to turn up the lights, and then there will be things that tell us that we have to dim them again. Uh, and for the foreseeable future, uh, that's probably how we'll we'll be moving forward. Next slide. Uh, I'm gonna talk about basically uh, the challenges that we had here in the Madison region as we were faced with planning for this, the things we had to do, uh, how we needed to change our operations, the challenges with that, uh, but then also as we started to look at how we needed to fold back in business uh, to meet the needs of our patients, uh, the different things we had to look at, which I think may not be exactly the same as what the business sector will have to do, uh, but I do think uh, there are some corollaries. Uh, and then touch briefly on the financial impacts uh, here for UW Health. Uh, you know, where healthcare is a business like any other, and uh, this has been uh, hugely disruptive to us. Uh, next slide. So we began planning for COVID-19 in mid-January, and it wasn't a high-level plan, but we knew that we might uh, get patients from, at that point, we thought Wuhan, China, yeah, that might he, have he got, disease. We needed to have a planning place that. to manage that. that. Um, uh, and sure it. enough, I think, as all of you realize, on January 30th, we did receive our first patient. Uh, it was an individual who came directly from yeah, the airport. Uh, our processes it. worked well, but I think where we had some benefit there is we worked in close collaboration with the CDC, the Department of Health, uh, and it kind of got us geared up to be thinking maybe more intentionally about COVID than we would have otherwise thought about it. Uh, our incident command reopened on 228. Uh, and if you guys recall, uh, that was the end of the week where we started seeing reports out of Italy and Iran uh, that they were having difficulty containing this virus. And at that point, uh, those of us at UW Health, uh, we thought that we were more than likely headed towards a pandemic scenario uh, and that we had to get things uh, put together. 
so we created a, a governance structure. Typically, we would use a healthcare or a hospital incident command system uh, to respond to a disaster. But, but to be frank, that, that system works well if something blows up or if the power goes out or if there's a disaster. Um, it didn't completely meet our needs for this idea that something was coming but wasn't yet here, uh, and then all the contents expertise that we needed uh, to get ready. Uh, so we um, did a hybrid structure with our HICS structure as well as 13 work groups. Uh, we had well over 100 staff, managers, directors, other leaders uh, that were tagged uh, and prioritized 103 different action items initially uh, to get us close. And I think one of the key things that we did is even though we're a large health system, we realized that we could not do this alone and that we would have to collaborate with partners. Uh, and we collaborated with the health systems in town. We collaborated with uh, UW campus, which led to a number of different innovations, uh, business partners, city and county. We offered uh, services to the state emergency operations center. And um, uh, as we did that on, on March 22nd, uh, we ended up admitting uh, COVID patients uh, that required inpatient care. I think we admitted three on that day uh, and uh, started doing this. Next uh, slide. So as part of our plan, uh, an early plan was this idea of progressive planning, which is you know, making capacity that didn't exist to meet the demands that we might see for COVID while still meeting current patient needs. And there's really three things we had to think about. So space, converting space, uh, understanding the infrastructure, does the HVAC system work? Do we have enough flow of oxygen to run ventilators? Uh, supply, so ventilators, ventilator tubing, uh, supply chain, pharmacy, do we have enough medications to keep people sedated and paralyzed if we need it? Uh, dialysis machines, as there's a high rate of uh, renal failure in COVID-19, infusion pumps, airway equipment. And then really the most difficult thing in all this was actually staffing. Uh, so how do we uh, train staff? Uh, how do we redeploy staff? Uh, and a lot of that happened as we turned down our urgent and non-emergent procedures we created a labor pool. Uh, they weren't exactly trained for what we needed them to do, but it did allow us to do training and redeploy them. Early on, it was our hotline, it was employee health. Uh, over time, we retrained 2,000 nurses that could then work in an inpatient setting or an ICU setting, also trained hundreds of physicians so they could be more effective in the inpatient environment uh, or our ICUs, uh, and then really mapped out what we could do to surge to meet the needs of patients. And I think, you know, one of the learnings we had here is uh, we really needed to uh, push decision making down to the front line and, and power execution uh, at the front line because the uh, number of services and uh, lines that we needed to have working together were, were vast. So, uh, to, you know, to create an ICU space, I have to have facilities working with security, environmental services, provider staffing, RN staffing, respiratory therapy, uh, IS services, uh, data predictive analytics, pharmacy and supply chain, that's a huge group and we didn't have a lot of time. Uh, so uh, that was a, a cool thing. And then out of that came a lot of innovation. Uh, we were able to pull up a drive-through testing center in about two days. Uh, when we started running out of hand sanitizer, we were able to work with a pharmacy to do the Badger Brew hand sanitizer. Uh, we found ways to pasteurize breathing circuits so we could reuse them. We'd never done that before. We found ways to sterilize N95 masks. Uh, it was pretty uh, inspiring to see all the innovation and teamwork uh, that happened to make our plan uh, successful. But what we also realized is that uh, we had a lot of patients who weren't necessarily getting the care that they needed. It might not have been an, an urgent or an emergent procedure, uh, but it certainly wasn't something that could go on for forever. Uh, so that's where we started having our progressive plan, working with our essential services plan to ensure that we could start to bring back online uh, those things that we had postponed, uh, but we had to make sure we could do it in a safe way while also meeting any surge in COVID-19 cases that we would see. Next slide. So what did we need to bring services back? Um, one was robust data analytics, both an idea of what was going on in the community. Uh, where were we on the curve? Were we seeing a flattening? Were we not seeing a flattening? We needed this information to know if we could turn up services or if we needed to dial them back down. Uh, we also needed uh, predictive analytics that we thought were uh, believable uh, so that we could have some idea when we might be able to turn things on and when we might need to turn things back. Uh, personal protective equipment uh, is something that you've all heard about has been in somewhat short supply. We needed to understand our burn rates on that as well as where our supplies were so that if we were going to bring procedures back in, we didn't use up our PPE on those procedures uh, and uh, not have it available for COVID-19 patients that we needed to take care of uh, as they began coming in. 
I think a big thing that needs to happen, uh, not just for health systems, but also uh, as we look at this more broadly across the business sector, uh, is testing capacity and, and efficiency. Uh, we need to understand uh, who has this, uh, and we also need to get those test back, uh, test results back somewhat quickly. Uh, waiting three or four days for a test result uh, is, is really problematic. Uh, and uh, as time has gone on, testing capacity has increased a lot. I know Dr. Raymond mentioned that some of the spikes that we're seeing may be related to increased testing. Uh, and that's probably true. So I think that's a bit of a bright spot that we can look at uh, and think about how we can maybe lean into that a, a little bit. Uh, COVID-19, I mentioned this early on, but but I think, uh, you know, plans that say on this date we can do all this stuff um, are, are a little bit hard to initially swallow. Uh, I think a, a better approach would be to look at um, these things that are in, um, you know, the Badger bounce back and these other plans and say, you know, where are we at with this? How can we work together uh, to make that happen? And then, you know, turn the lights up a little bit and then we might have to dial them back down. Uh, and that's exactly the, the approach that we're taking uh, as a health system. Um, uh, we want to turn things up when it's safe to do so, and we can do it safely, and we also know that we may immediately need to uh, turn things down if the situation changes uh, on the ground. Next slide. So I'm going to switch gears a little bit and talk a little bit about um, the economic impacts of COVID-19 to our health system. As many of you know, uh, our bread and butter is really those kind of elective procedural type things, uh, procedures in general, um, are really what bolster uh, our bottom line. And when we made the decision to postpone those things, uh, and uh, one thing that uh, wasn't on my radar, as I figured we'd have to postpone procedures because volumes of patients were getting so high, uh, we actually needed to postpone procedures to participate in social distancing. We couldn't bring high-risk patients into our organization uh, without a way to uh, keep them safely uh, distanced. Uh, so because we made that decision, we have now postponed close to 6,000 procedures, uh, which is a 62% drop in our operations. And uh, our volume in our hospitals are now down 45%. Uh, and when we run that through um, our finance department, our expected revenue losses between March 15th and June 30th would have approached $400 million uh, without any actions to mitigate that. Uh, and it's not that UW Health is alone in this. I think you're seeing reports from all over the country uh, that other health systems are in this situation, uh, trying to figure out what they can do uh, and noting that although there is stimulus dollars, the stimulus dollars just aren't enough to uh, overcome the losses that we're currently seeing. Next slide. So what are the efforts that we're taking? Um, you know, we're taking efforts just like other health systems. Uh, I think I'm a little bit misspoken on here where SSM has announced their intention to do things but hasn't uh, announced the specifics. Uh, but for UW Health, we've had to delay or put on hold all of our strategic initiatives for uh, this FY and next FY. Uh, we uh, have salary reductions for leadership, um, management, uh, executive leaders, uh, physicians, uh, to try to make some of this up. Uh, we've gotten rid of all of our incentive um, bonuses for uh, this next, uh, this FY20, uh, doing some flexing of hourly staff to meet patient demand, uh, and currently in, in a hiring freeze uh, to try to recruit uh, some of these losses that we're, we're currently seeing, which is hard to do because we're, you know, trying to be ramped up for uh, potentially a surge in COVID-19 patients, uh, but um, our, our managers and directors and others are working on this pretty hard uh, right now. Next slide. So I think, you know, the summary for healthcare is really we have a, a battle on three fronts. So uh, one, we're making sure that we're ready for this pandemic and that we could handle, you know, up to hundreds of more patients than we typically would. And how do we get that right and provide the right care? Uh, at the same time, we can't ignore the baseline needs of our community as it pertains to their health needs. So how do we uh, bring those services back online in a safe way that doesn't put the patients at risk? It doesn't put our staff at risk. Uh, and it doesn't put our pandemic plan uh, at risk. Uh, and then thirdly, uh, we need to protect our financial health so that we're ability, we have our ability to meet, meet our mission uh, as, we, as we go through this. Uh, next slide. But I think all of us in healthcare are, are, are really trying to figure out, you know, what are our, our top priorities? And I think, you know, we have a, a look into this that's a little bit different because we, we do walk through our ICU spaces and we do walk through the floors and we can see uh, the impacts of this. Um, so I don't think anyone uh, is um, underselling the financial implications of this and how difficult and challenging that is right now. 
uh, I think, you know, we balance that with the reality. It's a, it's a real reality that if we don't do this uh, collaboratively and take the right steps and make sure we do it safely, uh, things could get much worse. And I never thought in my career that I would be sitting on a committee uh, trying to figure out um, an equitable way to take a ventilator away from one person uh, and give it to a, another person. Uh, just uh, the, the motions you have when you're going through those kind of documents, uh, it, just, it just really seems like you're in the twilight zone. Uh, so I think, you know, healthcare is grateful for these safer at home orders. Uh, we know that they have helped save lives. We also know that they're not sustainable for forever. Uh, so, you know, as we return to a more normal state and work with our business partners, we really want to collaborate, uh, be sharing of our data, uh, look at those metrics uh, and engage with all of our business leaders to figure out how can we as quickly as possible uh, get this stuff done uh, so that when it becomes safe to do this, you know, we're ready to go. And then likewise, if things start to change, how do we work quickly to dial things back? Next slide. I think that's it for me. Yep. Thank you, Dr. Podhoff, for that. Um, boy, it really, uh, you know, I as I approach this, um, I'm thinking about the, you know, the balancing of public health and the economy and what you're demonstrating is that the, the health care um, that you're providing is even more central in that conversation because of that moment, right, where you're trying to figure out how to do these necessary procedures that are being uh, postponed right now. And so, uh, you know, I just really appreciate the, the very comprehensive view you just gave us about the challenges that you're facing. And, you know, I want to thank you for your work. Um, as you're thinking about this, I, I, there isn't a day that has gone by through this crisis that in my notebook where I keep my notes, I haven't written in all caps, healthcare. Um, it's really kind of the invisible fabric that's holding this together and will continue to as we move forward out of this. And so again, I, I just want to say thank you for your work. Um, it's very much appreciated. Um, we are going to um, invite Dr. I'm sorry, we're done with our doctors for the day, for the moment. Uh, we'll come back with uh, questions for them. I want to just, uh, if you're joining us late today, we do have uh, some technical challenges that uh, we're, we're wrestling through, but we're still having a good conversation. The recording of this will be available um, following the meeting shortly, and we'll also be following up with a survey about the Badger Bounce Back um, plan. So I wanna introduce um, Brian Hollenbach. Brian is the Executive Vice President of Green Bay Packaging, and uh, we've been uh, really blessed to have um, great executives from all over Wisconsin joining us in this series to talk about the, the strategies they're uh, deploying at their facilities and in their businesses to address the COVID-19 crisis. Um, Brian, are you there? I am, yeah. Thank you, Missy, and thank you to the Regional Leadership Council and the WEDC, and I guess a shout out to New North for, for inviting me to be a part of this effort. Um, I also want to thank Dr. Raymond and Dr. Podoff uh, that was a wealth of information and it's very, very helpful. So just real briefly about Green Bay Packaging. So we're a privately held third generation family corporation. We were established in 1933 by George Cress. We made a horse collars at that point. We, we changed a little bit since then. Uh, Will Cress is third generation. He's president and CEO. Um, we employ, we're one of the largest privately held packaging companies in the country. Uh, we employ 4,200 people across the country, headquartered in Green Bay. We have uh, 1,500 employees in Wisconsin, uh, over 1,000 in Brown County alone. And we're currently in the middle of our single largest investment in our history and the largest investment in the history of Brown County. And that's we're building a, a new recycled paper mill. Timing's everything, right? We didn't, we didn't anticipate uh, COVID-19 when we uh, started building a new recycled paper mill. So I'll talk to you a little bit about uh, what COVID-19, how we responded to that and, uh, and where we are today pertaining, pertaining to uh, the crisis. So, you know, every decision we made pertaining to this crisis really was centered on two values. Number one was safeguarding our employees. And number two, frankly, was making sure um, that we protect our business for now and into the future. So then when we're out of this, do we have a strong business? So we're blessed in that packaging is an essential part of the supply chain. And as such, uh, we have stayed operational throughout the pandemic, and, and we know what a blessing that is. Um, we do feel like we, we jumped on this issue fairly early. Prior to this call, I reviewed my notes, and our first meeting on, on COVID was March 10th. 
And by the week of March 16th, um, we had established procedures for significantly eliminating uh, visitors, um, completely eliminating business travel, tracking all personal travel, and frankly, uh, strongly encouraging our employees uh, to, to dramatically reduce any personal travel. Um, we started changing the workplace immediately for social distancing, staggering breaks, sanitation. The nice, the nice thing about our company is that our values have always tied into safety and housekeeping. And many of our plants are uh, what they call BRC certified, which is British Retail Consortium, and that's for food safety. Um, so we already had very strong sanitation practices in almost all of our plants, but we did kick it up uh, quite a few notches. Um, we also put standing operating procedures in place for all the different potential uh, um, alternatives we could think of that would happen um, pertaining to things like potential employee exposure um, if we have a confirmed test. But I think, Missy, you started this off by saying you have to be flexible and dynamic in these type of situations, and that's that's what we try to do. Um, we set up teams. I think some of the best things we did, honestly, as far as the best practice, we set up a war room mentality. And I know that term sometimes overstated, but but I will tell you, by March by March 12th, we had a meeting every morning at 9 a.m. Um, with seven different folks representing different divisions as well as representing leadership and, and our nurses. We have a number of nurses on staff. Um, and we, we, we meet every single day since then on exactly what we need to do. And then, then we set up separate uh, committees on PPEs, um, on IT, because we had to set up uh, away from homework, um, as well as how do we really social distance at the work site? How do we stagger breaks, et cetera? And that continues to today. Uh, one of the biggest challenges we had was personal protective equipment, locating it and finding it and purchasing it. Uh, to date, we've spent over $500,000 on, on purchase, uh, personal protective equipment. Um, we've, I think we've done a very good job on that, but it's, it's, a, it's, an, on, it's an ongoing challenge. So it's been, it's been, uh, it's been a pretty unique situation. We, we think we've developed a good open communication system across all of our divisions. We, we have over 30 divisions across the country. Um, and the way we're structured is that each division has a general manager and a leader. Most of them report up through me, um, but each one of those divisions also had to be provided guidelines on how to run their division, how to run their plant. Um, and so we talk routinely, uh, we talk daily, but we have uh, required meetings every single week on just on COVID-19 alone with every single division. That's in addition to what we do with the war room. Um, I think one of the best things we also did is very clear decision making criteria on what if something happens. So sometimes giving an example is the best way to explain this. So this happened very, very early. So it's kind of a it was pretty interesting. So this happened about March 17th, I think it was. And we were still in the middle, frankly, of, of trying to source PPE. Um, we were also in the middle, literally in the middle of negotiating with a third party sanitation company in case we had a confirmed case and, and we needed to have somebody there beyond our employees to clean an operation. And so it was about 11 o'clock, I remember pretty distinctly, and uh, I got a phone call at my house and it was from one of our divisions that not a Wisconsin division, a different division. And what we had found out was one of our employees approached us right in the middle of the shift and he said he lives with his grandmother and he, uh, his grandmother just got confirmed as a, a confirmed case. And so our, our division leader did it, he followed all the right protocol. He, he first off, he called people outside of his division, myself and, and our head of legal counsel, a gentleman by the name of Adam Winters, who's done a great job leading a big part of this, and started going through, here's what I'm gonna do. So he, he pulled away from his the crisis for 15 minutes, and that's one of our protocols, pull away from the crisis for 15 minutes and talk to some other folks so that we could start asking questions. So then what he did was he, uh, this gentleman was a, uh, forklift driver. So we secured the forklift, we shut down the operation, um, we secured the entire area. And the next step was to start doing sanitation. But it was so early that we didn't have PPE in place. So what we did at 1130 that night is we got on the phone with our third party sanitation company and we finalized the negotiations ad hoc with that company, um, a company called US Ecology. That company ended up coming on site then within 30 minutes with their entire team um, and they clean the entire operation, specifically the work areas, obviously. And we were back up and running at 6 a.m. Um, so it was 
pretty dynamic. When you say being dynamic in, in this environment, you need to you need to be dynamic. And that was a that was kind of an interesting example of what we did. We're looking forward to get to the other side. Um, we reviewed the Badger bounce back uh, program. We actually think that's a, a very good outline of, of the things that need to happen. Um, so now we're in a process of developing an organized and safe method to to bring our employees back. We I don't think I mentioned this, but our, on our A&O side, we have over 700 employees working from home right now. Um, IT has, has done a great job, but we want to bring them back in a, in a safe manner. Again, safeguarding the employees, but also bring them back to the workforce as we can, as it makes sense in a, every different state that we're in. So we're looking at, we're developing a detailed plan. Um, we're most likely going to go with a staggered approach of bringing folks back in. We're definitely going to have PPE available for all employees. So whether it's required or not, if an, if an employee wants a, a, a cloth mask, they can have a cloth mask or a dust mask. Um, if they wanna wear gloves, we'll have that available. We will definitely have social distancing in place at all of our operations as employees come back. Um, we're actually looking at even work, moving workstations if needed to make sure that uh, there's six feet or more in between every workstation. But so we got a lot going on, a lot of crisis management going on, but we're very optimistic about the future. We're very, uh, I can't say enough about our employees. They've really stepped up. Our, our attendance has been actually better than it's ever been. Um, about 4% of our workforce is out due to uh, COVID-19 issues. Usually it's got to do with um, close contact or potentially close contact. And, and we tend to take a very conservative approach if an employee says they have a close contact, we, we just say, okay, <laughs> and they immediately go on 14 day self quarantine. And then we uh, pay them, uh, we pay them the SNA uh, uh, amount and we don't take any taxes out. We actually uh, eliminated any waiting period as well. Um, so we've luck, been lucky across all of our divisions. We've only had three confirmed cases. Um, and we've, I think we've done a very good job uh, handling those. So uh, we work close with the uh, USW. Uh, United Steel Workers have been really good to work with on this. And um, it's challenging times, a lot of anxiety out there, but uh, like everybody, we're ready to restart the engine of the economy, but we wanna do it in, in the right way and uh, safeguard our employees and then, and then get our business back running like, uh, like we want it to be, like everybody does. Well, thanks, Brian. I really appreciate that overview and I appreciate um, your focus on employee safety. You know, as I traveled around the state before uh, this all started uh, for the first period of my time, um, again and again, I was struck by the concern and the thoughtfulness for all of the companies in Wisconsin for the safety of employees. And I think that's something that we know how to do really well and a strength that we can use going forward um, as we you know will continue to face the challenge of COVID-19 until we have a vaccine and you know critical is going to be keeping um, the workforce uh, healthy and safe during that time. I'm going to turn it to Jan Allman. Jan is the CEO of Fink and Theory Merchant Marinette Marine. Um, Jan, it is good to uh, hear your voice. I feel like I, the last time I saw you was a very long time ago, but I think it was only a couple months ago. So uh, I'll turn it yes. over to you, Jan. Hey, I feel we're all aging quickly with COVID. So, but thank you. I, I'd like to thank WDC, Governor Evers, New North, and you know everyone on the call, because these I think these informational meetings are very valuable. And I also want to just give a shout out for my strong regional team that has been providing us guidance throughout this pandemic. You know, and just kind of give a little bit of background for us, you know, Fink and Terry has multiple locations throughout the state of Wisconsin. So we really try to do a standardized approach and apply best practices across the state. Um, for those who may not know really quick, a little bit about Fink and Terry, we are the number, uh, Fink and Terry is the number one shipbuilder in the Western hemisphere. They have about 21 shipyards across four continents. And um, they're also an Italian company. So we were able to get a lot of lessons learned because they were ahead of the US uh, with this crisis. So we've actually been in this journey starting in January where a task force was assigned just to get prepped and ready for COVID. You know, in the state of Wisconsin, we have actually three facilities. We have Marinette Marine, we have Fincantary Ace Marine, and Fincantary Bay Shipbuilding. 
And then other locations are in Florida, Texas, California, and Virginia, as well as Washington, D.C. For programs, you know, we, we build littoral combat ships and multi-mission service combatants for the U.S. Navy. You know, we are a secure site, and we're also part of national critical infrastructure. So we are required to stay open. So, you know, this is a lot, you know, probably different challenges than most because we need to do everything we can to protect our workforce. You know, we have 78 years of history building ships, so we want to make sure, and they're multi-generation, you know, we are the community, you know, we're one of the largest employers, so it's really essential that, you know, people feel that we are doing everything we can to protect it. And I will say that we have an extremely great relationship with um, the head, you know, the, the boiler makers. They have been, you know, they do feel that, you know, we're, we're in it together because we need to do everything we can to protect our workforce. Um, you know, just quickly, you know, a little bit about how, how we, how we operate. You know, we are on six month centers. You know, we have two starts of constructions, two keel lanes, two launches, two, uh, builders trials, and then two commissionings for our products. So, you know, we have multiple ships going at, at the same time. We have roughly, about 2,500 employees entering our site every day, and that's anywhere from military personnel, Lockheed Martin personnel, subcontractors, and our people. So uh, not only are, are we looking at these practices, we're establishing those practices with our subcontractors, you know, our supply base, you know, the, the Navy, and anybody who comes on the site, we need to make sure that they're adhering to these policies. So a lot of, a lot of work has to go in to making sure that's alignment. And the biggest thing for us that we're really working on is securing uh, the future, which uh, we're currently um, one of the top contenders for the FFGX program, which we anticipate that award to be uh, in the summer of this year. So just kind of highlight some of the key things that we've been working on. Um, as I said, we started in, in January and February, and some of the things that we just thought about is that we have a pandemic response book, right? And this also included, you know, if someone in the leadership team, um, like for myself, would actually get the virus, who would be, the, what is the succession planning? So that you actually have that established. You know, we have everyone taking their laptops home who are coming to work so that if we have an issue to where you have to take. A, right. And this also included, you know, if someone in the leadership team um, like for I'm myself, sorry. would actually get the virus. We're getting some feedback, one second. The succession planning so that you actually have that established. You know, we. Okay, thank you. So anyway, we had, um, we had, um, you know, we need to make sure that we're really thinking deeply about how we actually operate. And I'll also share uh, lessons learned. So just kind of access things that, to think about, you know, since we have multi-sites, so we have all visitors, you know, non-employees. They must uh, do a pre-screening pre-screening questionnaire, okay? Uh, and it's really COVID-related, and that uh, we also ensure that our vendors, customers, contractors, anyone else coming on the site is doing a daily questionnaire, which includes them taking temperatures. And it's a series of basically, you know, um, if you actually have COVID-like symptoms to if you have been exposed to COVID, et cetera, there's a series of questions that they take prior to ending the workforce. If they actually have those, we tell them to stay home and contact their HR to not come in. Um, for travel, you know, we have suspended intercompany travel between sites so that if there was someone, there was an outbreak or someone had exposure, that we would limit that exposure to that site so that it wouldn't go across from site to site and create spread. Uh, we've eliminated all travel, you know, uh, you know, basically across everybody's using webinars or Skype or our phone. Um, we are no longer traveling at all. Uh, we've, we've basically have killed that. You know, we have turnstiles because we are a secure site. You know, people do need to badge in because they have to make sure they have the clearance to actually come on our property. So, and then they enter a turnstile. So we have washing stations inside and outside the gate. And then we, we have posted signs to basically use your body through them. But we felt people were still concerned with that. Uh, we, meet, we meet almost daily with our union personnel to, as we get feedback of things that we can do to improve. And I think that's learning operation 
because I think this has been a journey for everybody as we progress through that. So we also have set up, we bought additional scanner, manual scanners, so they're no touch that we open the gate during that time. So you have to come a little earlier, but you can scan in and leave scanning out uh, without touching anything as well. Uh, so I think the really thing is really make sure that you have flexibility for to try to address as many people's concerns and eliminate that as you move along. You know, uh, we had established deep cleaning crews, you know, well in advance, brought additional personnel on site, and we really focused on high touch areas. And a lot of things we did were not necessarily that made people happy, like we eliminated the coffee machine and um, the coffee pots because that's a high touch contact area. So when you start taking coffee from people, you know, that kind of gets people excited. But, you know, it was to really mitigate that that high touch area that you could not make, you know, you would not cause that cross contamination. Um, some of the other things that we did is that obviously social distancing, you know, when you're in, you know, a manufacturing environment, particularly when you're doing ship construction, that's sometimes very difficult to do. So, you know, we, we asked uh, people to voluntarily go to off shifts. We also offered this for people as they, you know, the schools got canceled. You know, if they had child care concerns, they could also go to off shift. So, you know, we tried to increase that. We also did uh, a work from home program. We have about 20% of our workforce currently working on, at home. Um, we also looked at class sizes. First of all, did we absolutely, was it business necessity to hold them? So we have deferred many of our classes that are not business necessity, but like for our safety training that we need to do uh, ongoing as well as certifications, we've limited our class sizes to ensure that people have the proper social distancing. Um, and then we've also gone off and rented off property, you know, larger areas to ensure that people have social distancing. Um, lunch rooms, we, you know, similar to what the packaging plan has done, we've also split into more shifts, but in between those shifts, we conduct team deep cleaning. So there's there's so much time in between those that we perform deep cleaning in between those lumps to, to ensure that um, that that nothing's getting transferred from one group to another. Um, as I talked about, you know, we do a lot of supplier uh, coordination to ensure people are in compliance as well as with the U.S. Navy and Lockheed Martin. Some of the other things is is that I think it's important, you know, of our lesson learned and issues. You know, um, you know, I try to copy with pride. You know, I, as I was going to uh, grocery stores, I saw that they were incorporating plexiglass. So when we saw that learning, we applied plexiglass to where we saw high contact areas of personnel. So like if we had a crib, we installed plexiglass. You know, um, security or, or even in when people come into uh, the front desk and downstairs, there is now a plexiglass as well as signage for social distancing. Um, we also incorporated, I don't know if anybody knows this, ozone makers, ozone kills SARS. We run those in all the buildings. We, we have them operational. We have a schedule that we run them in, in high contact areas as well as all the buildings throughout the evenings when no one's in there um, to ensure that we are killing um, anything that's airborne as well as surface uh, oriented related to, to um you know, the virus, as well as our deep killing practices. We have people on site on all shifts that, for instance, if you, even your desk, they'll come in, they'll wipe down your phones, they wipe down your desk, they'll wash your phone, hand, your cell phones, anything you have, they're constantly in if they continue to wipe down surfaces. We even went to the extent to ensure that they're changing rags frequently. So we gave them how many, you know, what they have to do. We have a procedure set up of what they do to make sure that they're changing rags frequently, even as they do those wipe downs. Some of our challenges has been very similar to PPE. And, and what I challenge is people start back up. You we, you have to be very creative because, um, you know, when we first started, you know, you, I'm sure everybody experiences, it was very hard getting disinfectant wipes and, and hand sanitizers, right? So, but, you know, we've been able to, extend out our chain. Um, we actually got a hold of some um, veterans who are making hand sanitizer for the Navy. It's through a whiskey company and we were able to incorporate that. So, you know, we're actually, we got so many gallons of, of 
hand sanitizer that we're offering it to their employees if they bring in a vi an empty vial that we're allowing them to take home. Um, masks, you know, as we recall back in March, uh, you know, the CDC guideline was that not to provide masks to your employees. So when that changed on April 3rd, you know, we've been doing this big scramble to get masks. We plan on incorporating masks. Um, hopefully, I actually will have my shipment here this afternoon. So we will have a mask program for our employees. Right now, we have, you know, we've told our employees if they have a handmade mask and would like to wear them, they can. Many of our welders already have face masks that they wear all day, but we're making sure that we have masks available for all employees on the site. We, the, one of the other big challenges was thermometers because we wanted to make sure that employees were doing their temperature checks. Our first, we tried to actually get real thermometers and they were actually uh, confiscated by FEMA. So we had to go and got, we actually have those throwaway temperature strips that they're one time use that employees use. Um, I do want to highlight that, you know, uh, we did have one person yesterday that test positive on the site, the first one amongst the shipyards. But I do feel that one of the things that we did do early on is that we established a very strong relationship with those clients, with the local health department. We actually had them come and do a fresh eyes review with us early on to help us make any recommendations of what they felt that we could do. But we had established that relationship. So when this issue occurred, we were able to, to immediately uh, take action uh, related to that. So we, we basically quarantined the individuals that were, were impacted associated with that. We did a deep cleanse associated with that. Uh, I think it's really important to do transparent communications. We were able to send out uh, communications to all our people, making sure they knew and were aware what was happening. And we're right now working on putting it on our website so that if anybody wants to see, you know, the status of what's happening in the yard, you know, they can see it um, from the corporate website. Um, and we continue to, with uh, deep cleaning, obviously we deep clean that area, but we continue with our deep cleaning uh, practices uh, throughout the yard. So I, I just think it's a lot of diligence um, that you need to have as you maintain operations. And that's really all I have for today. Thank you, Jan. I, I really appreciate that um, thorough description of everything that you've done. Uh, you know, I've, I've been seeing the proactive work of businesses all around the state, as I've mentioned, and learning about the protocols. Um, I love that you learned uh, what you saw in the grocery store and took that back to, a, you know, a manufacturer like Think Interior. That's, that's amazing. Um, I'm also a little worried that you took away coffee and, you know, I worry about the rebellion that uh, I know we would have in our shop if we took away coffee, but fortunately we're all able to be remote. Um, we have a few minutes left and, and I wanted to just ask um, a question for the group, um, whoever feels like they can chime in. Um, the new normal is a term that we keep using, um, and I wanna, I'm wondering what you're thinking about as far as the new normal goes and where you're seeing investments that you're making now are most likely gonna be permanent or you know, at least for the foreseeable future or make a lot of sense for your business. Um, maybe we'll, Brian, can I put you on the spot for what you all are thinking about for the new normal? Sure, yeah. Thanks, Misty, that's a good question. We think about we think about that a lot. You know, you gotta learn from every crisis, right? And so I think some of the things we've put in place that will continue um, indefinitely, concepts like staggering breaks, um, as much as possible social distancing, there will come a time I'm sure when folks are gonna want that to go away. Um, but uh, additional PPE, like maybe not requiring masks, but certainly if people want to wear masks, allowing that. Um, frankly, those are smart things, right? I mean, at the end of the day, that could uh, reduce uh, flu-like symptoms, could reduce colds, as well as obviously uh, COVID-19. I, so I see those happening. I probably also see um, more work at home than we've had certainly in the past, historically at our company. Um, there's some departments where it seems to work pretty well. And uh, yeah, I think we're going to allow more of that than we've had uh, allowed in the past. Thank you. That, those are two really good examples of uh, things that I think will will stick. Uh, Jan, do you have any thoughts on on things that you're seeing that you're like, wow, we should have been doing that, and we're going to keep doing that beyond into the new normal? Well, I think I, like we talk about the new normal. You know, when we 
we we actually meet every two days with the assistant secretary of the Navy talking about our issues. But for us, for shipbuilding, we think that's going to, this is going to continue um, for quite some time, you know, like over until we actually have a um, a shot, you know, some type of a vaccine that can prevent this from happening. So we are planning on continuing our deep cleaning practices. We don't plan on stopping any of our practices until, you know, we feel that our employees are safe. I do think this has driven a lot of awareness. So I think for the long haul, no matter what, we're going to have hand washing stations. You know, um, really, you know, I we've talked about even on going for the influenza or even flu season that these are practices that we probably should be incorporating as part of our our way of life as you move forward. And obviously, the things that we put in for like plexiglass, et cetera, those things will stay there forever. So I think it's really given us the learning that. You can never, you can never do enough, right? And you need to constantly be ever vigilant because you never know when this may happen again. Thank you. And Dr. Podhoff, uh, what's your perspective on healthcare and the new normal? So I think the big thing is going to be telehealth and virtual health. Um, I think we were all looking at that cliff, and we, you know, didn't think patients would like it, and we knew maybe our doctors wouldn't like it, and we didn't have payers that were necessarily willing to reimburse for it. And then COVID-19 totally kicked us all over the edge. And now, you know, scheduling hundreds of appointments per week through these virtual technologies, I think that's something that will be um, uh, an unforeseen uh, benefit uh, coming coming out of here will, would be the one that comes to my mind first. It's, it's amazing how things that seemed like such big obstacles and, you know, we could never get there and, and have changed overnight in so many different ways. Um, I want to really thank our panelists. We're getting to the top of our hour, and I want to make sure that we turn it back over to Eric Johnson to give us a sense of um, uh, how we can access this recording and the handouts for folks who haven't been able to see that. Um, again, you know, I want to thank the Regional Leadership Council, our strategic partners in this, uh, for bringing this all together, and we will continue to have a series next week. Um, and we will get the word out about who is joining us uh, for our leadership. I've got a, a, someone I recruited today that I'm pretty excited about, but hopefully we can get either on the next uh, webinar or the one after that. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Eric. And Eric, if you could just let folks know um, uh, where we are as far as the recording and the handouts go. Thank you, everybody. Thank you to our panelists. Thank you, Missy. Uh, I'll just say that I believe the recording has uh, recorded as planned and is being uploaded to the cloud now. Uh, when that's complete, I will uh, download a uh, copy of that and put in a Dropbox location and send around uh, an updated email to the full uh, registration list where they can see that playback. Again, apologies, GoToWebinar has had a system-wide uh, problem today. Webcams were offline, questions were offline for a good many of you. I know many of you in the web browser have not had audio or, or slides. So uh, we lost quite a few of you, unfortunately, uh, but I believe this is a fairly isolated incident. We should be back, uh, all systems go by next Friday. Uh, so with that, Missy, um, any final words and we'll shut her down. No, just everybody stay safe, stay healthy, and um, continue to do all the best we can for Wisconsin. And don't forget to look at the Badger bounce back plan and answer the survey question. Thanks everybody, take care. <laughs>